raised in Hazelbank Gardens at number 53, when I was young, the Raploch was a wondrous place to me. The Gowan Hill and the Shell Park were the playgrounds of this boy, and recalling childhood memories just fills my heart with joy. As I grew a little older, it was here I met my wife. We would walk these streets together and plan our future life. We would walk along Glen Devon Drive, up Weir Street and Raplock Road, past Muirhead Shop and Rockies, as the old drip road we strode. When I heard about the changes, progress says is a must. All these streets had been demolished, houses piles of bricks and dust. I showed my children all the places where their parents used to play, and the house in Gownhill Gardens where their granny used to stay, and the place where miners gathered as they waited for the bus that would take them to the pit heads where they sweated in the dust. In my heart I hold these memories, the good times and the bad, and I'm proud to stand up tall and say, I am a Raplock lad. When I was your age, I used to watch the girls skipping in the playground. We had a boys' playground and a girls' playground, and we were not allowed to cross over or we'd be in trouble. The boys watched the girls. They were fantastic. They would sing and they would have rhymes and they would do all sorts of tricks. And sometimes you would see three or four or five or six girls all skipping and jumping through the same rope together. I just thought they were magic, like acrobats. Boys got to play hopscotch. But the girls did too, but the boys were pretty good at it. It meant a lot of jumping with one leg and two legs, and some people call it peeva. I think they would call it peeva here. And you can get simple hot squat squares, and sometimes really complicated ones. You can add more and more squares and make it more and more difficult. It was a very complicated game. A center for butter, oh I, oh I. A center for butter, oh why, oh why? A center for butter, and she fell in the gutter. Oh, the world must be coming to an end, oh why? A center for bread, oh why, oh why? A center for bread, oh why, oh why? A center for bread. Here was a game that you had an old tin, a tin polished and empty, you filled it with muck, and you had maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine square hole squares and you had to shove the throw the peaver, however it's square it jumped it went it landed and you had to hop skip to get that and pick it up and hop skip back. And that was what was called peaver. If we were playing a game like hide and seek, we would have to find out who was going to be out. So this is how we would do it. We'd say, hands up, and then I would do this. I would say one potato, two potato, three potato, four, five potato, six potato, seven potato, more. Put your hand behind your back. And then we'd keep going like that. One potato, two potato, three potato, four, five potato, six potato, seven potato, more. Put my hand behind my back. One potato, two potato, three potato, four, five potato, six potato, seven potato, more. Oh, it's not going to me be. We would keep doing that until we found out who was out. Uh 
I'd like to mention this, a conquer or a chestnut. It was a great sport with the boys in the Rutlock and all other areas in the autumn time. You challenged your friends and you tried to strike their uh, conquer and if you broke it, you had won. If your conquer won five times, it was a bully five. We got help for our parents and the grandparents. They used to put them in the, the oven of the agar to harden them so that when you did challenge your friends, that was a bit harder than maybe theirs and you could win more games with it. But also, if it was a winter's night, you were away to the school early in the morning so you could get another bag of them. You had to use your own imagination in these days. You didn't get as much toys as the kids in that get now. One year I got the pram and I had to wait for the foot to the next year to get the doll. But there was a wee lady that stayed across in one of the other cottages and she knitted a rag doll to put in my pram. Well, I did have a dolly, but I had to wait till I was about eight, which would be the year after I got my pram. It was a china doll and um, when I was at school, I was to put the doll on top of the wardrobe so that my young sister couldn't get it, because if she broke it, I would have got leathered. <laughs> but the person that broke my doll was my dad, because he used to keep his fishing rod on top of the wardrobe, and he went to take his fishing rod out one day, and he knocked the doll off the top of the wardrobe, and it smashed to bits. So I was quite ill about that. <laughs> No, I was about seven when we moved through to this area and the, the farm cottage that we came from before didn't have any electricity in it, so it was all like tilly lamps and what have you. We moved into this cottage, the cottage here and there was electric lights and I, used to, I got a row from my dad because I was running through all the rooms and switching on and off the lights. <laughs> Couldn't understand why you switched this and then the lights came on. When my cousins came to our house on holiday, I used to take them over this field where the, the cows were. They used to run like blazes away back because they were absolutely petrified. <laughs> well, after I'd left school, I had to be in for a certain time. And if you were late, you were in serious trouble. It used to be awful when you went to the pictures because the pictures used to finish at 20 past 10. But I had to leave and get the bus for the bus station at uh, quarter to ten to be home for ten o'clock. If I was late home, I was in serious trouble. <laughs> and Sally's home life? Her mother doesn't intend to relax her discipline now, just when Sally needs it most. Oh, hello, Kay. Just a minute, Kay. Mother, can I even answer the phone without you listening in? Sally, I don't want you going out tonight. You've been out far too much lately. All right, Kay, I'll go. I suppose Mother will make a fuss, but I'll be there. I used to watch the end of the pictures when they come on the telly. <laughs> oh, this is just absolutely magic. This is one of the best things a boy could ever have. His own carty or bogey or soapbox, call it what you will, different names, different parts. And the kids then were the world's best recyclers. He's our mum's old pram wheels. Sometimes it was a big set of pram wheels there. You learned all the crafts of using woodwork and metalwork. And you would sit on it and go at fantastic speed. A box around the back, cushions tucked in if you want to make it really comfy. And obviously a rope here for steering, but sometimes we would steer like that. And somebody would pull you or push you to get you going. Races, fantastic speeds. Now, the clever ones would have brakes on it. You needed a brake. I would pull mine. This is a cracking brake, look at that. It's a foot brake. There would be a wire, I think, running to the back here. And clearly when I thump that, it's going to put the brakes on the back there. Just brilliant. Come on, let's go. Oh no, here's Cigarro trying to pinch my victor, I mean my bogey, again. Well, what's this? I told you.
told you the last time that if I caught you smoking again, I would tell your father, and this time I certainly will. I won't have it. I won't have it at all. You cheeky little devil, you. Get away from here at once. Here you are, son. Get me two leeks in a pail. Such a nice wee lad, that. And so obliging. Oh, well. What's the use of wasting it? Oh, and I often think back to when I was a kid, the brilliant times you had playing games when you didn't have a care in the world and all that mattered was how you were going to win something over a pal. Great one, this. Everybody had these. In a bag, in a box. You'll probably guess what it is. This box is a tobacco box, of course. And inside, I've got my marbles. I have a collection of marbles. Right noisy. Every schoolboy had them. Different places call them bulls, and locally it would be bulls here. Um, there were all kinds, these are glass ones, and of course you would get steel ones from the factories, perhaps they were ball bearings, and then sometimes clay ones, but they could break. So the marbles, the idea was that you would set yourself up like a game of balls, and you're rolling against your opponent and trying to take them out. The great thing was you'd get a huge pile of them, you win, whatever you took out of your pal, and you would accumulate, and you'd have this big swag bag of marbles that you'd take home and go. What I was always puzzled about, now that I think about it, was it seemed to me, back then, there was a marble season. Who ever said, it's marble time? Brilliant fun. Oh, take me back. Where I learned to swim was uh, an area that was called the Clay Dykes and uh, it was quite a lot of wee small pools. Some were deep, some were shallow. But it was the, bit, the, the one bit where it was called the horse's shoe and uh, that's where I learned to swim because the older boys got a hold of me and just threw me into the deepest bit. You were struggling, you were actually, you could say you were drowning at the time because you went right under. But you, you automatically, your legs and your arms started to go up and down, swim. And you could call it swimming, but that started you off. And once you came up for air, the older boys got a hood of you, and they actually showed you how to swim. And it was then they left you, and it was up to you to get back into the bank. And that's basically how I learned to swim. Beforehand, we used big inner tubes from cars and tractors, and we got them blown up with the local garage in the drip road. You could call it a boat, so we used a bit of wood as a paddle. And that, that was us until we actually learned to swim. One of the times when we were swimming down the clay dikes, some of us came out of the water and just lay on the grassy bank. We thought we heard what was thunder, but oh, no sign of lightning or anything like that. But then we noticed as we were sitting, the water was creeping up towards us in the, the grass bank. And then, then it really did get dark. But before we knew what was happening, we had to grab our clothes and our gear and run up, up to higher ground as the water was really coming right up towards us. It wasn't until later we found out what had happened. It was a, what they call a flash flood. A heavy rain and a thunderstorm up in the hills. Water, the only one way to go, was up towards the banking. So that was a wee bit of excitement for the day, and uh, it's, well, we laughed at it after, but one or two got their clothes soaking, so they had to walk even in swimming trunks. In the 60s, I worked for Alexander Buses and I was a bus driver. I transported people to Deanson Mall, Ridge of Arm, Fort and Seal, uh, the Mullane Mall, uh, Tobacco Factory, and then we'd done the school runs, St. Morden's, and all the local schools round about. You know, we'd done quite a lot there. The times when I was driving the bus in the 60s, we had somebody called, we had girls and men 
who were called clickies. Their actual, their, their name was conductor and conductors. And these people had big machines and money bags. And they had to go up and down stairs all day. And some ladies were prone to getting varicose veins because it was that heavy a job up and down stairs. And then they had to make sure at every bus stop that people stayed well back to the platform until the bus stopped. You know, they were, they were kept going all day, so they were hard bits of stuff. A bus is now due. They have just time to catch it. They know that buses run to carefully prepared timetables and are always punctual. People never have long to wait. At regular stopping places along the roads, people wait quietly in line. It's well to be sure that you get in one that is going to the part you want to reach. The people enter the bus in an orderly manner, no crowding or pushing out of turn, and the conductor controls everything in a cheerful way. It is this friendly cooperation between passengers and conductor and driver that makes bus travelling comfortable. Being a driver with Walter Alexander was an experience in itself. Every day was different. It was a job that I liked and it was worth doing when you see no folk get on the buses. And remember, the buses were open doors then, and the conductors and the driver were responsible for the safety, as well as the transportation of the passengers. There were no indicators, you had to indicate yourself, which meant you had to keep your hand out the window, and you had to give turning right. That meant turning left. That meant slowing down. That meant pass me if you want and that meant stop or coming out. So the physical stay as well as just sitting down, like, you know what I mean? There is one very important matter that the driver has always to be ready for. Children crossing a road. There are special crossing places marked on the roads for people to use. And it's the custom for children leaving or going to a school to form in a procession to cross together. The driver sees this is going to take place and stops his bus. It's a rule that's made for safety and he never breaks it. I can remember uh, one time I was getting fed up with the same crowd, the young guys, I knew them. But a kick in the, a kick in the backside was not going to do these guys. So one day I just drove right to the police station and uh, they got a bollocking for the death sergeant or whatever, you know. And the next day they were wee angels. You had to have a, a good sense of humour. But you also had to have character as well because some people would uh, take kindness for softness, you know what I mean? And then when you've got people coming on at night, especially men, we are drinking them, and they try and cuddle you and kiss you and give you money for their bus ticket and all that, get on that, you know. So you had to have a, a bit of come and go. But you have to make sure you didn't get abused either, you know. You could slap in the face in the ground sometimes, you know what I mean? And I've seen that happening and a, quite, on a few occasions, you know what I mean? When you're slapped, you'll take it and like it. My mother worked in Deanston Mill starting away back about 1940 when she was a girl of 15 and the girls all had to cycle to work in these days. Uh, their parents bought them a bike and my mother worked as a spinner and I remember her telling us she wove it into towels and sheeting and it was during war time so there was plenty of work going for them then. I remember too when after she had her family she went back to Deanston Mill to work again and uh, there was a, a bus strike, a transport bus strike. The drivers of that company 
had sprinkled nails and broken glass and things on the road. I remember her telling me about that and it was to prevent them from getting to work. But they had a lot of good times and, and it helped, women going out to work helped families to get that wee bit more in these days. And she really did enjoy it. Dainson Distillery, which is situated outside Doon, wasn't always a distillery. It was only converted in 1966. But for many years before that, it was actually a cotton mill. Some of the buildings within the distillery we still use today. The bonded warehouse used to be a weaving shed and was built in 1825. The ceiling is made of stone and there are circles in the roof which in the old days would have had a glass dome on the top to provide light. I would imagine that in the old days it would have been a very hot, dirty, noisy and dark place to work. At the height of the mill time about a thousand people would have worked in this weaving shed, but most of the workforce would have been women and children because the women had very nimble fingers and the children had to go under the looms to clean them. So I'm sure it wasn't a very pleasant place to work. In our still house, there are four huge copper stills. Three floors of the old mill had to be taken out to get them in. During the Napoleonic Wars, coinage was very difficult to come by. So, the owners of the mill decided to stamp their own coins using French doubloons and they called them Dainstons. They then paid the workers in this coinage and the workers could then buy goods from the shop in the village in return. 1,500 people worked in the mill at its height but only 500 by the time it closed in 1966. When it became a distillery, only 20 people were needed. Today, we have 12 people that make our whiskey, one of which is the third generation to work in the building. He's our stillman and his parents and his grandparents worked in the mill and he now works in the distillery. I was 15 when I started work and I stayed down at the Duke Bridge. I had to cycle up to the bridge, leave my bike at the bridge, run across the bridge and catch Alexander's buses to bring me up to Deanston Mill. Now when I got there, everybody was in a hurry trying to go off the bus where there was five or six hundred people trying to get in and out so that we could all get in and clocked in before we could actually go up and start our actual work. After my five years of learning how to be a terry weaver, I was more or less promoted to doing different colours of tartans. And my supervisor taught me everything I knew and the end product was fantastic. I worked in Deanston Mill from 1948 to 1960. I came from Ratloch Road in the Ratloch and we got the bus in the Drip Road in the morning just round the corner from the, the garage of the bus depot Alexander's. It was quite a tiring day because well, you, were, you were on the go all the time because you had to get your work done. I worked with Molly Hines putting in the web bar and this day him and I were taking one in, and he was at one end and I was at the other end. Of course, we're having a laugh and joking. And he pulled it round. I said, and I fell. I said, and but I show everybody got in the mill that day. It was quite a laugh, although I was quite embarrassed.
Remember in the late sixties, just before the mill was ready to close, I must have been witness to the only strike that was ever in Dean's Mill. All down to Jim Jim Pimflight, who came from the Rattler, lovely guy, full of mischief, talked us into having a strike over a silly little matter after their tea break. When the looms didn't go on, up come the, the boss. What's going on here? Jim Pim pipes up, we're on strike. Are you the spokesman? Yes, down to the office. Five minutes later, Jim Pim was walking the mill road home. <laughs> I really enjoyed doing this project. It brought back a lot of happy memories. I would really love to do a project like this again. I hope this film will be good for schools. And the part of the film I really enjoyed doing was making the music for the film and I hope you have enjoyed it. Yes, I thoroughly enjoyed it, making the film, doing the research, uh, and we had good fun with the, uh, the ladies. No, scrap that. <laughs> 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 as, as soon as I said that, I went, no! Oh. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> We'd like to say a big thank you from Rapplock Community Partnership to the Heritage Lottery for funding this film. <laughs>